Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 30 of the Footmarks podcast. I am your host, Behram Kazi. You can find me at Def Mango on Twitter. And with me, as always, is Jared Kimber, who you can find absolutely everywhere. Now, Jared, the premise or title of this episode is Father of the Googly. And a lot of people know that Saklen Mushtaq invented the Dusra or Sarfaraz Nawaz was the mastermind behind Reverse Swing. But the pioneer of the Googly isn't spoken about enough. I doubt, Jared, that a lot of people have heard the name Bernard Bozenke. And we took some time to get that pronunciation right as well. Well, I can add a story about that. When I first talked about him, someone contacted me to say that I'd got it wrong. Mm. And I was like, and I Googled to see how you pronounced it. But apparently everyone in England knew how to pronounce it. And that's because his son went on to be a famous um, Mm. TV presenter, uh, news anchor, I think. But obviously, I didn't grow up in England, so I had no idea. And I thought it should, and I Googled it, and online, some people say it should be Bozen Key and all these different things. But yeah, apparently, it's Bozen K, as you now know, because I sent you a video of Rowan Atkinson singing his name. <laughs> yeah, I never knew that Rowan Atkinson was like big on British Saturday Night Live back in the day, whatever that is. I think that's what it is. But uh, anyway, back to Bernard Bozen K. Now, he came up with the wrong one during a game of Twisty Twasty. And to, for viewers, just to explain what that is, it's a game in which one player bounces a ball off a table, hoping that the player at the other end will drop it. And that's how you win that game. So, Jared, what do you know about Twisty Twasty and Bozen K? <laughs> I mean, it's not a real sport, obviously, Twisty Twasty. Yeah. I, I mean... It's the sort of thing that I would play with my cousins when we were bored, right? Like, you know, can we do this thing, try and get a ball past you or try and get you to drop the ball or whatever. You know, if you've ever been in a pool when you like try and skid uh-huh. the ball off a pool, it's, it, it's that kind of a game. And in that, um, uh, uh, Bozen K was obviously developed this ball that spun the other way, which in that kind of a game makes a lot of sense. But yeah, it's not, there's no Olympic version of, Twisty Toss 3. <laughs> and like, I've, I've, I think it was just a name that that family gave to that. But I mean, I've played similar games with my friends before. So it's the kind of thing you play when you've got a ball and no bat and you're in a, you know, in a room with someone and, you know, you stuff around a little bit. Yeah. So now let's talk about the man, Bernard Bozenke himself. He was amongst the English elite. Hmm. He was at Eton and went on to study at Oxford. And his father was the sheriff of Middlesex, which uh, I can only imagine, you know, early 1900s. Some guy is the sheriff of Middlesex. uh, Probably had a pretty good childhood in that regard, I suppose. Very lucrative one, at least. And he was a decent batter who could basically make the ball turn the other way when he was, you know, applying his leg spin, which now we know as the googly. Or back in the day, it was also known as the bozy. So um, you also mentioned in your piece long ago, and I think you also did a double century on this, that overall he was a middling cricketer. Tell me more about the man. Yeah, look, he was a good professional. He probably probably has a career with Middlesex, um, you know, obviously played university cricket as well. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't have gone on to being an international cricketer without this invention. His leg spin was pretty ropey. Um, it, you know, as an actual leg spinner, he was ordinary. And that's not the case for, you know, the the, the other bowlers that sort of took on that ball overall. But, he, he, you know, he was good enough to play. He was a gentleman which was quite important. So if you're a gentleman and you could hold the bat a little bit, you were going to have a decent uh, enough career. But I don't think anyone really thought of him as a star or, you know, a a legend of the game. And if he would have played Test Series, it probably would have been, you know, going to um, uh, South Africa because that's where where the the posh boys who weren't all that good at cricket often (laughs) went. Um, But, I mean, he averages in first-class cricket an average of 33, which is strong for his era. But... it's just the era when batters are getting a little bit better. Um, uh, uh, but he makes 10,000 first-class runs, an average, uh, average of 33 with 2100s. So he certainly wasn't a dud. But I don't think anyone really ever thought of him as a as a potential test player, although that whole term means a lot. It's very different now the way we think about it than the way we thought about it back then. But I, don't, I think he probably doesn't play any tests if he doesn't develop this ball. And as you said, he, he develops it with his friend, uh, with, with his um, brothers, I think it is, um, in, in this, you know, past, I don't even know if you call it a pastime, but just screwing around at home. Um, and then uh, and then what happens is after that, he gets to a point where he tries it in a game. And I think the first one bounces a couple of times, but still bowls someone. 
um, and everyone's laughing, but he's like, yeah, that is funny. But also he still thought that was supposed to spin the other way. Uh, whether it's reverse wing, um, the Dusra or um, the Googly, all of them existed before the pioneers. So there's stories of uh, of a Dusra, like in the, a, a Australian cricketer in the 1960s. Reverse swing goes back to the 1950s with uh, West Indies, and then also in the 60s in Australian cricket, there's talk of reverse swing. It's got different names. The difference is that what Bosi really does is very similar to what Sakle Mushtaq does. He works this thing out, and the Rongan certainly had been around beforehand, but people had bowled it by accident more often than not. Mm -hmm. Right. Or there were some bowlers who bowled it, but they bowled it every delivery. So it wasn't actually all that special. Um, because if you're bowling a wrong, if you're bowling leg spin and your hand goes a bit too far, you can sometimes accidentally bowl a wrong. And a lot of young leg spinners go into that. So he works on it. And to be fair, I, I don't want to take the piss, but he wasn't particularly good at leg spin, right? <laughs> it was just the fact that this ball didn't exist anywhere else. And so when you were playing, you know, playing against him. Like, I don't want to compare him to Sakhalin Mushak. Sakhalin Mushak was a fantastic off spinner who then worked out how to take the ball away from right hand butters. Bosi was a very ordinary leg spinner who now had a ball that looked like it was a leg spinner that went the other way. And if no one else can bowl that ball, you have weaponized your bowling to a level that, you know, I'm trying to think, like, let's imagine now someone was bowling the flipper, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like Shane Warne, but they were like, if Ish Sodi had a flipper, right? And that's even being unfair to Ish Sodi because I think he was certainly could land the ball more than both. But if Ish Sodi suddenly had a flipper and he's the only person in the world with a flipper and he can and he can bowl it whenever he wants, that was kind of what happened. And no one could pick it from the hand. So it was there was an explosion there. But if you look at his overall record, you know, he's not exactly, um, he's not someone that would say was a gun bowler beforehand. Uh, and he was also maybe not particularly interested in bowling as well. He just had this thing that was fantastic. And so he did it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what do you reckon? Is he more famous than uh, Bozen K Jr., the one who went on to become a TV personality? No, I think his son probably goes on to be more famous than him. Yeah. I think if we're being honest. He's actually the Bozen K. So it's, it's a Huguenot family. Um and there's a few famous Bozen Kays. There's another Bernard Bozen Kays who's a philosopher who ah. I, I think up until recently, um, and I've made this mistake in my book, um, I, a lot of people thought they were related, but it doesn't look like, and now I've, I've seen the full um, uh, family tree. It doesn't look like it were released. So I know it sounds weird, but there's actually three famous Bozen Kays, and he might have actually been the second most famous Bernard Bozen Kay um, of that <laughs> era. But in that period from... 1902 i'd say mm. off the top of my head maybe even 1899 through to 1925 ish he's he's quite famous um i'm trying to think of it like another player he would compare to oh it'll almost be like i want to say dilshan but maybe that's not true because um dilshan at least played a lot of creep but he's a little bit like dilshan in that every everyone knows who he is um for that one thing that he does despite the fact that as we've talked about, like he could hold a bat. He, he certainly wasn't a terrible uh, first-class batter in, in any sense of the word. Right. So you also mentioned that, uh, you know, he played cricket in the early 20th century. And uh, he actually, you know, that game of twisty twisty happened in the 1890s. He didn't bowl the googly up until 1900. But I just want you to tell our listeners and viewers about what cricket was like at the start of the 20th century. Because, you know, bowling was fairly basic. It didn't have a lot of variations in this and that. And the pitches had literal shit on them. Yeah, uh, we're talking about actual chunks of manure over here. So just paint that landscape for us. Yeah, so he's coming in at the end of that era when uh, liquidized manure, the muck spreaders are being used around the world. And so pitches are getting a lot better. So beforehand, all you really needed to do was run up and hit the pitch um, on a good line of length. And chances are the wicket would do all the work for you. So, you know, it's why when people look at WG Grace's batting average now, they're like, well, he averaged in the 30s. Why are we talking about this guy? And it's like, yeah, but everyone else averaged 18, right? <laughs> so, you know, th there's a reason why WG Grace was so much higher than for, than all the other players in his era. And and, and he would have played against Bozen, um, Bozen K as well. So it's just that era where you have to do something a little bit more special, right? And, and you have to do something else. The pitches are just done in the flat now. And you got to remember, the pitch is flattened out, but the batting techniques take a little while to adjust to that as well. So 
there's a there's a spike in batting averages in the 1890s, but it's really the 1900s when we go from not having what we would consider batting to having batting. It's mm-hmm. such a big dip. If you, if you go back and you look at Ranji and you look at WG Grace, they look they look like club cricketers, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas Hobbs does not. Hobbs looks like a, a test player. So there's a big difference there. And also, you know, you, you know Fred Spofforth, he, you know, his career overlaps a little bit with Bose's career. He he's discovering swing bowling in, you know, late 1870s, right? So early 1880s. So swing bowling didn't exist. They didn't really understand how they were swinging the ball. Uh, Fred Spofforth thought it was the revolutions he was putting on the ball, which might actually be true. And a lot of bowlers were like a combination between seam and spin. So you'll, mm-hmm. you'll read old reports of bowlers and one person will call them a seam bowler and someone else will call them a spin bowler. And it's mm-hmm. because um, there was so much interchange between those two different things. We're just also getting to the period where the lob bowlers are dying. You know what a lob bowler is? Are you, are you basically telling me that Benny Howell would have thrived in that era? Well, he would have been pretty <laughs> handy. But do you know what a lob bowler is? Uh, underarm? It's not just underarm. It's underarm up and down. Mm. Um, and so that was still... In existence so you can tell how basic bowling was so people could bowl off spin or leg spin but they're probably not really bowling off spin or leg spin they were probably bowling leg cutters and off cutters yeah if you look at what a modern slower ball is that's probably more what those spinners were doing rather than what shane Warren was doing or you know what you know modern spin bowlers do so it was sort of in the middle there so to have someone who obviously put enough revolutions on the ball in one direction and then to be able to put it in the other direction when people didn't even understand how they were swinging the ball correctly seam up bowling was just beginning you know all these sorts of things were happening you know us understanding what wrist position was and everything else so it was quite revolutionary from that perspective um in the way that in the way that that worked right so bosenke first started using the googly in the Oxford Nets, of course, he was studying there and played for them as well. Mm-hmm. And as you mentioned as well, his accuracy as a bowler wasn't great. His lines and lengths were quite off and uh, he didn't really use it, like I said, until 1900. And the twisty-twisty game happened in the mid-1890s. Or oh, Sorry, yeah, maybe mid-1890s or late-1890s, doesn't matter. But uh, do you think, you know, Bozy was aware of the level of innovation he would go on to be responsible for? He understood later. I don't think he understood at the time. Um, I don't think he worked on the ball enough. Uh, if if you go back, um, there were years when he didn't seem to bowl it all that much. Um, and, and he's not the first person to do that. And I've forgotten the name of the guy who invented the Dusra. Uh, not invented, but the first guy to sort of bowl the mm-hmm. Dusra at the professional level. As I said, he was an Australian guy. He went on to coach in Oxford, um, Victorian cricketer, and I've forgotten his name. But Richie Benno saw this guy bowling this delivery and said, what the hell are you doing? You could be the best bowler in the world with this. You should bowl this all the time. And so it wasn't the first time that someone had invented something and not specifically worked out how to weaponize it and become a great professional in it. And so Bosi would bowl it and then not bowl it. He kind of didn't. And, and also there was a huge stigma because it was kind of considered a novelty act or um, even against the, uh, eventually it would get so popular that people, a bit like what happened with reverse swing, a bit like what happened with the Dusra, a bit like what happened with West Indies in the short pitch bowling. People were thinking, should we outlaw this ball? Um, <laughs> and there were all these articles saying that the googly was ruining cricket, right? That's how prevalent it becomes. And so he kind of has this complex relationship with it at times where he's not always fully like, this is a great ball and you all have to trust me here. There are times when he's a little bit more hedging his bets with how it is. And, mm. and you know, we've seen that. Safra's um, Noaz still claims that he didn't use reverse swing at the MCG when he took seven for one, right? And it's like, it's, mate, the ball was 30 overs old. Like, what do you, <laughs> what do you, what do you want us to believe? That it just uh, started <laughs> happening? So I, I think that tells you that there is a, um, what's the best way of putting it? That there is a um, a weird relationship that he has with it, and because he wasn't a full time leg spinner as well, like I think even he felt like you know it wasn't it wasn't always something that he wanted to be known for. Like mm-hmm. it, it, you have to think about who he is. He's from this sheriff of Middlesex family. <laughs> he went to Eton. He went to Oxford. 
He's a really good professional cricketer, even if he's not an England level cricketer. And remember, back then that didn't matter as much. That matters to us now. At the time, he was a good county player and that meant a lot, right? And now his name is being associated with this one little novelty, novelty act thing. And you can understand why he is a little bit, um, he has this weirder relationship with that. Right. So Bernard Bozenke, let's talk about his career a bit. He got selected for England uh, for an Ashes series, Tour of mm -hmm. Australia in 1903, courtesy of his all-round skills. And after seven years in, oh, sorry, not seven years, seven test matches in two years, he was dropped from the side because his numbers, or at least batting numbers, didn't quite translate at test level. You mentioned how he had, what, 20, 21 hundreds with an average of 33, which at that time was quite massive. His highest score in test cricket was 27. And he took mm. 25 wickets at 24 apiece, which isn't all that bad, but his economy was 3.7. And he wasn't really treated as a genuine all-rounder. He was someone who was primarily a batter and who could, you know, bowl a bit part-time and all of that. Yeah. He is still the father of the googly and we're doing this entire podcast on him but he couldn't master his own skill like like you said he couldn't weaponize the googly to that extent and do you think that that was a shortcoming or that was just the era that he played in that no that was his fault i think um mm. because so as you said he plays seven matches he bowls in 11 innings he ends up with a bowling average of 24 mm. but the uh, it was 3.7 runs and over which is obviously quite expensive for that era um but um he he's kind of seen as either he can bowl or he can't bowl. So I'm trying to think of, again, someone like maybe remember when Michael Bevan had that period where he bowled really, really well, but there were many other times when they didn't think he, you know, could land it. I'm trying to think if there's anyone else who's ever kind of been like that. Like had he bowled more consistently, he would have had a very long test career. But, mm -hmm. but I do want to just stress the fact that it wasn't as important at that point for all cricketers. So there's a lot of really good players who didn't play as many test matches as they should have just because they could get paid more to play in other places. You know, you've got some, someone like Sidney Barnes who, you know, who ends up bowling the wrong in himself. And he, um, you know, he doesn't even always play first class cricket because he doesn't want to, right? Like mm. he can get more money playing league cricket. There's all these little things going on uh, with, with, that, with that. But you're right. If he'd taken his bowling seriously and been able to land the ball more consistently, I think they would have played a lot more matches. That said, it's still 25 wickets in seven games. But I think if you go through it, I think it's a lot of wickets um, uh, in a couple of, um, like, uh, I think he, it's 25 wickets, but it's two five wicket hauls and a four wicket haul. Um, yeah. So he basically, when it, when it was working, he was unplayable. And when it wasn't working, they felt he was unbowlable. And that's hmm. kind of, and if you look through his uh, entire first class re record, you can kind of see that pattern with him quite a bit. Yeah. So Bozenke, of course, he didn't master the googly himself, but he taught the googly to, well, a young London batter called Reggie Schwartz. Mm. And uh, he then emigrated to South Africa, Reggie. And uh, like you mentioned, Posh Boys going to South Africa, charting out a career over there. He slotted into their first team. And then he also taught it to his Transvaal teammates. Uh, what are their names? Bert Vogler. Aubrey Faulkner, you love talking about Aubrey Faulkner, and uh, Gordon White. And yep. neither of these three guys, actually just one of these three guys, averaged a smidgen over 20, which was uh, Gordon White. So yeah. Bozenke turned these non-bowlers into superstars and basically unplayable leg spinners. So this was probably the turning point with respect to the delivery getting super popular. Yeah, so... so it, it, it's a fascinating story. So Reggie Swartz, as you said... I think he was a Jewish player, um, but was certainly, you know, um, on the sort of fringes of that sort of upper class professional, uh, mm -hmm. upper, upper class gentlemanly type uh, player. He gets quite close with Bozenke. There's a very big chance that he taught Bozenke, as Bozenke taught him the delivery when they're in Philadelphia, uh, playing on a tour of the MCC, which kind of tells you uh, the kind of men they were just traveling around the world, playing a little bit of cricket mm -hmm. in Philadelphia. Sir, would you like to try this? But yeah. the big difference is, as you said, that he goes and teaches it to all these other people. Whereas that's what I don't understand, that why no one else was learning this ball. Mm -hmm. And how either Bozenke had taught other people and they didn't master it, or he didn't. And maybe Reggie Swartz was a better teacher. I, that, that we'll never know, unfortunately. Uh, no one really ever went into the details there. But Reggie Swartz goes back. And this would be like, and we'll go back to the Sucklane one. Imagine mm -hmm. Sucklane went back. And he said to three um, young Pakistani batters, 
right? So I don't know who would that be. Yun- Yunus Khan, Mizbah al Haq, and uh, Farwad. Uh, sure. Would Farwad? Shoaib Malik. Sure yeah, Farwad Malik. would probably be too young at that point. Shoaib yeah. was just, yeah, teenager. Well, right. And literally took them and said, look, I've got this ball. I know you're not a bowler, but I think mm. you could work this ball out. And he turned what were three really decent young batting prospects into um, strike bowlers. And really, as you said, the only one who doesn't destroy is Gordon White. And I don't think Gordon White even plays that much. Um, uh, sorry, bowls all that much, I should say, um, in in outside of first-class cricket. But Transvaal are suddenly incredible. And so up until that point, I think... South Africa had only drawn a single test against Australia. And that was yep. one where Australia's boat was delayed. And so they literally get off the boat. They play South Africa. South Africa managed to draw against them. England was sending second and third string teams, maybe if we're being honest, like fifth and sixth string teams at times to play them. They, but but they can see South Africa are getting better. Right? So they're sending slightly better teams. They go out, and if my memory serves me correct, um, the, uh, England lose to um, uh, Transvaal. Is it West Transvaal? I can't remember. Whichever Transvaal they play. Um, they lose to them in a tour game. And straight away, England's like, what the hell? And at that stage, professional cricket was played on matting as well, which meant that, as you know, you played on matting. Matting always spins. Right, you, you know, it's it's not like a test wicket where you have to wait for it to to degrade. It's like you could spin the ball from the first ball if you wanted to, and they've got all these leg spinners available to them, and it's obvious from day one that now, if you think about, if you think about the advantages, they now have batting that goes almost all the way down. So I think in one game their captain bats at number eleven, and he was a pretty uh-huh. good bat as well, right? because they have all these other guys in their side who can bowl and who can bat, right? And so, and and even, I think they have, I think it's Jimmy Sinclair, Tip Snook um, are their seamers. And I think both, uh, Jimmy Sinclair could definitely bat. I think Tip Snook could uh, bat a little bit as well. But there's, they've got two or three guys who can bowl, seam and bat because it's South Africa. And now they have four spinners hmm. who can bat and also bowl. So they bat from z- uh, from one to 11, and they've got like six, seven, eight bowling options, nine bowling options available to them at times. Um, they can bat, have their wicket keeper at number eleven. Um, in one- <laughs> it's suddenly this incredibly deep team. And remember, I've just said they've only ever drawn a test before, and we're what sixteen years into them playing test matches at this point. Yeah. So just just to stress on that, you know, over a span of seventeen years, you know. South Africa played 11 test matches. They lost 10 and drew one. And this tour that you're talking about, it was 1905-06. Yep. England, like you mentioned, sent a team which wasn't first string by any means. And all four of these guys, right? Schwartz, Vogler, White, and Aubrey Faulkner. Uh, they were featuring for South Africa. And in this first test, actually, you know, this leg spinning combination accounts for 12 English wickets across two innings. So mm-hmm. that's 60% of all English wickets falling to leg spin. And uh, the Proteas needed 284 to win in the fourth innings, which is still quite a sizable score. Maybe not as much as, you know, uh, three, four decades ago, but 284 is still a task and a half in the fourth innings. And uh, they were reduced to 105 for six, South Africa. Mm-hmm. And then for their last wicket, as you mentioned, the the wicketkeeper captain came out at at 11. They still needed 45 runs and they won that test match. That was their first ever test victory on that uh, or during that series. They did go on to win four test matches. And out of the 95 English wickets that they took, 43 uh, were accounted for by leg spin, which is absolutely fantastic. And that too at 19 apiece. So the Mm -hmm. average was quite low as well. So it's just like amazing to me. It's crazy that a nation like South Africa which is renowned to be, you know, pace heavy, faster tracks, that sort of stuff. It got its first big break in international cricket, courtesy of an art that absolutely no one associates it with. Mm-hmm. And, and and on top of that, I think all of the four leg spinners were making their debut. Right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I, I, off the top of my head, I'm pretty sure none of them had played before. All four of them were batters, right? So you, it's just the whole thing doesn't make any sense. And by the end of the tour... I think England start to work it out a little bit more, right? And, you know, going ahead, probably Aubrey Faulkner is the only real, maybe world-class level bowler who, after people worked him out, was still a very good bowler, right? He still had a brilliant wrong and all the way through. But people, you know, 
the others, the others got they got a little bit more gimmicky, a little bit like Sakhalin Mushak does. That that's the other problem with this ball, right? Is you start to bowl it too much, um, and and batters even subconsciously start to pick it, even if they don't always pick it um, um, directly um, in that way. They start to work out how to do it um, more often than not. So, you know, you get to a position where um, these things are moving, moving forward, and it's that one series which changes everything. It's that one series, really, if we're being honest, mate, that sets up world cricket because. Mm. That's the series that allows South Africa to be at, of a level where they can ask for the ICC to be formed, the Imperial Cricket Council. That uh-huh. is the series that leads us to our first tri-series between South Africa, Australia and England. That is the series where South Africa start to ring Australia. Remember, at this point, really, England toured places and Australia went to England. It wasn't as if world cricket was travelling around all that much. There were other tours, of course, but... You know, I don't think South Africa had played a test outside of South Africa at that point. They weren't, uh, these matches weren't actually always considered test matches. We retrospectively call them test matches. Hmm. That wasn't the case back then. It was huge, the impact that it had. And as you said, when I first got involved with this, I think it was an old Gideon Haig article that I'd read somewhere. Hmm. And he was talking about, you know, some, he was comparing something to the time that South Africa um, had four leg spinners and beat England. And I was like, you what now? <laughs> because it's so the opposite of how we think of South African cricket, right? Yeah. Now, there are reasons for that. As I said, the matting wickets were a big part of that. Also, before World War II, especially with uncovered wickets, spinners did a lot better in Australia and South Africa and England and New Zealand just because, you know, they could occasionally bowl on wet wickets and all that sort of stuff. But then you, when you actually hear the story, it's crazier. England invented this thing. And the guy who invented it was like, eh, yeah, I use it sometimes, but I've never really got all that good at it. And these four random dudes are like, oh, we'll take it up. And, you know, they go on to be just a fantastic bowling attack. And uh, it really is just a remarkable story of, of uh, you know, and, and they all as well had these, um, I don't know, I think only one of them lives into old age. Right. Hmm. So um, Gordon White dies in the war. I was saying World War One. Oh. I think that's right. Um, one of them, beca- I'm t- trying to remember all the different things. Yeah, so no, two of them died in the war. Um, uh, Reggie Swartz dies in the war. Gordon White dies in the war. Um, Aubrey Faulkner takes his own life when he's a legendary coach in, in England. Um, and I think it's just uh, Bert Vogler who actually lives to old age. So again, sort of like these should be, household names in south africa right like if south african cricket is known how are these four men not known and yet they weren't even particularly famous by the 1960s right it's mm. not it's not the you know reformation of of south africa as a society that starts to sideline them they kind of look down upon and part of the reason is south african cricket was so bad in the 20s and 30s right and it's really the 30s they start to get good again then into the 1950s they're okay and then by the 1960s we're starting to see the south africa we see today and then of course apartheid hits but they weren't really remembered as this incredible um uh nation uh at that point and so the uh, those players just all disappear and it's very hard there's there's no proper books written about these guys um i i on four different occasions i've pitched to publishers the story of these four men and on all four occasions the publishers are like this is a great story and on all four occasions they're going we can't write about four white white <laughs> south africans from early 1900s and it's one of the reasons i've written so much about Aubrey Faulkner. and hopefully we'll get a chance to write about all four of them because i do think they're important and I, I, it's an incredible story of you know some of them fought in the Boer war as well um mm-hmm. You know, I, I think I think I said before, I think it's Reggie Swartz is one of the I think Reggie Swartz was Jewish. I want to try and get that right. I think that's the case that he was Jewish and there aren't that many um, uh, cricketers who are Jewish. God, I hope I've got that right. And I haven't confused him with someone else there. Um, no, there he is. List of Jewish cricketers. and uh, He's on that list. So uh, Michael, Michael Klinger's probably on it too, right? It's it's there's no, it's not a long list. Um, Fred Truman, I think, um, becomes Jewish, but I don't think he was born into a Jewish um, family. So again, you've got to remember what, I mean, I don't think we even need a reminder. Like there's still anti-Semitism around everywhere in the world. Um, Mm -hmm. There are still issues about, you know, Jewish athletes and Jews can't play sport and all these sorts of things. And yet you have this random dude (laughs) happens to be like 
who happens to circumnavigate all of that and then go on to have this fantastic career. Um, I think, um, so I know with Aubrey Faulkner for a fact that he fought in the Boer War and then fought in World War One, right? He also becomes a pioneer of coaching, right? Gordon White is part of this four. And I think in that test series you're talking about, takes like two wickets and which might've been in that first game. Like he doesn't take a lot of wickets. He's like, yeah, he still gets remembered um, in that group. It's just, it's, it's a really fascinating um, uh, group of people. And it's a bizarre story from beginning to end. And then, by as I said, by the 1920s, this ball is now so popular that this ball is ruining cricket. And again, <laughs> had South Africa not beaten England, I don't know if that narrative would have quite gone in that direction. That's a little bit like the West Indies short balls and the Dusra and the, and the reverse swing and all those sorts of things. That it was like, it was actually seen as like, n- just not cricket. <laughs> if England players had all perfected the, the wrong end, I don't think it probably would have had that same impact, right? right. Uh, but But again... They kind of were English. Like even Aubrey Faulkner was born in South Africa, raised in South Africa, but was kind of brought up British. Like he fought for the Brits in the Boer War, not 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 with the other South Africans. Um, and so, you know, and if you have, the, you know, Bridget Swartz is obviously Jewish, but Vogler, um, White and Faulkner, I think are all um, English um, South Africans. So kind of were English, but they were South Africans um, uh, in that way. It, it's, it's fascinating on so many levels. Yeah, and uh, you know how in modern day cricket, the wrong gun is one of the most important weapons uh, for leg spinners uh, across all formats, but even more so in T20 cricket. And, uh, you know, you've mentioned it. I obviously read about it too, that back in the day, it was viewed by many as this sort of unfair delivery. And we're talking about like seasoned first class cricketers. What was it? Arthur Shrewsbury? Do I have the name right? Something like that. Played 59 first games and called it unfair. Does that surprise you at all? <laughs> No, I mean, we, we see this in, in cricket all the time. I'm pretty sure, I believe the story, it may be apocryphal. I need to get Abhishek Mukherjee to uh, come in on it. But there is a story that the first time forward defense was played, someone yelled out, it's just not, that's just not cricket, right? <laughs> so almost every bit of innovation in cricket has been met with, that's just not cricket, right? Mm-hmm. This colored clothing, God, mm-hmm. up until 10 years ago, people were still calling it pajama cricket, right? And... And so every, at every point in cricket, you do get that uh, that side of things happening. So I don't think it was surprising. And then you've got to remember that leg spin was around and there were some good leg spinners, but it wasn't considered like a first tier bowling, right? Probably finger spin was bigger back in those days. Seam bowling, swing bowling were just really starting to get big. And then out of nowhere, wrist spin kind of jumps all of them. Um, and, and, and let's just go back to the story. Four batters learned how to do this in essentially a summer. And, well, actually, probably in a winter, right? And ended up dominating a test nation. It's probably fair to say that it, there was an unfair advantage to, to this ball um, at that point, at, at certain times. Um, I, I think it's it's a really interesting um, delivery just in general. Like, So for those who don't know, essentially when you're bowling, um, it's just that your wrist goes a little bit further than a normal leg spinner. So instead of stopping there, you go around and you turn your wrist into a different angle. It's a beautiful bit of subterfuge, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's not, the deucer wasn't pretty, right? And reverse swing relies on, you know, conditions, sometimes tampering and all sorts of other things. Whereas anyone can get the ball to spin in either direction if they can use their wrist correctly at, at any stage in a completely legal way. It is a beautiful thing. And the other thing is that, why it was so hard to play i suppose the one thing i need to explain is that is we used to two things either being able to see what a bowler was doing and react to it or know that the pitch was going to ruin their lives right they had gotten used to those two things now they had a ball that to their eyes was spinning away and was spinning back in and even when you start to retrain yourself like if you're a club cricketer and you face a, a player who only bowls wrong ends, right which sometimes happens when you face that that delivery it still takes you two or three overs to get to get used to it because as the ball comes out of the hand you're still expecting it to spin away and that was the other issue that these guys had so it's it, it was fascinating the impact that it had it's alarming to me that Bozenke himself didn't have that sort of faith in this delivery and you know he even stopped bowling the ball frequently towards the end of his career and 
he was almost apologetic for it at times as well you know based on all the bashing that it received by other cricketers who called it like unfair or ungentlemanly like or whatever you want to call it even in that uh, morning post newspaper you know he did sound a touch apologetic even though he said that it's an ordinary break which is a result of uh, an extraordinary method which is true mm. just like you mentioned right now with the ball and this became the delivery that was the last delivery faced by donald bradman and uh, it was the delivery that denied him averaging 100 in test match cricket this could be the most phenomenal untold story in all of cricket especially if you consider the kickstarter impact it had on different things uh, like that south africa series yeah yeah i mean it's the ball that kind of gives us the icc as i said is mm. like there's no other delivery that has that kind of impact um it's probably the ball that begins with bat with bowlers trying to hide things from batters, right? Because up until, as I said, up until that point, you didn't really need to either. I'm not saying there wasn't tricks and everything, because certainly Spothers was playing tricks and George Lohman clearly understood what he was doing with the ball. And you go back to some of the old underarm bowlers, it, even they had little tricks. But this is the first kind of major replicable trick that that, that people could use that, that had a big impact. Um, so it was absolutely huge. And And if you think about it, kind of by the 60s it's died down quite a bit right like and maybe by the time chandra and richie have stopped bowling it no longer has the kind of impact that it once did abdul Qadir is kind of bowling it on his own for a long period of time um shane warne is not a uh, wrong and bowler like he has one but if he took 25 wickets with his wrong and you know maybe 50 at most right and that's across international cricket let alone mm -hmm. um uh, uh, test and Okumble had a wrong end, but again, not massively his frontline delivery. He and I think and in Anil Kumble, you actually see a story of why the wrong end changes. Because I reckon if you go back and you watch him bowl in the IPL, he has a higher percentage of wrong end bowl there than I'd ever seen at any time in his career. So he worked out why it was going to be important. And Mushak Ahmed is, of course, the other bowler um, that is that is famous for the wrong end, and he sort of comes off the back of. Uh, um, of Abdul Qadir and and, and um, Shahid Afridi um, bowls it a little bit as well, but maybe again, maybe not his stock. Um, well, not obviously no stock ball, but maybe not his main weapon. His main weapon is probably the faster ball, for being honest with him. Yep. Um, and and then and so the wrong end is not that when you have the guy who reinvents leg spin, kind of doesn't bowl them all that much. Um, it it's it's there, but there aren't that many guys who are really making a living from it. And of course, T20 comes along. And suddenly, yeah. everything changes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, based on that point, I mean, we've, we've of course talked about the impact of the googly back in the day. But if you look at the modern day game, particularly T20 cricket, you've got your Rashid Khans. Uh, Kuldeep Yadav has a beautiful wrong one as well. And all of a sudden, it's this major stock delivery and everyone's wary of it. Not everyone can pick it. Adil Rashid also has a pretty decent one. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, Bernard Bozenke didn't intend for it to go to this depth and this distance but you know it was one of those domino effects that over a course of uh, 100 years or more than 100 years at this point has gone through its crests and troughs but today mm. is one of the most prominent uh, you know uh, weapons uh, as far as spin bowling is concerned in our game would you call it the greatest cricket innovation of the early early 20th century or was it the liquefied manure <laughs> <laughs> no, because that happens late. That happens so late. It's the eighteen hundreds has lots of stuff. It has overarm bowling and and the liquid manure, right? Mm. Also, Grace invents batting footwork at that stage, mm. right? I think yeah, the early nineteen hundreds is probably it. Probably is uh, you know the googly, and then I suppose by the nineteen twenties, it's probably replaced by the bouncer. Um, mm. Not that the bouncer didn't exist before, but the pitches weren't hard enough and bowlers weren't fast enough to do it consistently. So the, the bouncer probably has a bit. The bouncer didn't have as big an impact straight away as the googly, but over a long period of time, it's had a far bigger impact, right? It, it has really changed the sport more than the wrong one has. But sorry, and I keep going between googly and wrong one. Um, uh, and also, we could be calling it a BOSI as well. So yeah. I could really uh, fuck with everyone's mind um, at a certain <laughs> point here. But um, it's all the same ball. Just so that, if, yeah. just to clear up any confusion, it's all the same ball. Wrong and is more heavily used in Australia. BOSI was the original name. Um, but yeah, so so I do think that. I, also, I, it's a shame for me that Bozenke did not live long enough to see it. I think even if he'd seen it. So 
so Clary Grimmett and Bill O'Reilly, probably arguably the two greatest bowlers of the 1930s, both are leg spinners who are wrong and dependent. Hmm. I think by that stage, they were just seen as geniuses, right? And he didn't get to see them in tandem as much as maybe he should have. Although, uh, well, he was by the end, by that stage, he was at the end of his life. So I don't know if he got to enjoy it as much. But by the 1940s, 1950s, as I said, it's a very normal delivery. You know, there are leg spinners all around the world at that stage. Almost all leg spinners bowl that ball. Um, and then, it, and then it does have that quiet period. It would have been great for him, you know, as someone who didn't fully embrace it himself because of the embarrassment it brought him at times, it would, would have been great if someone could have just gone back from, you know, gone back in the time machine just to say, I know this is going to sound weird, but one day this is the ball that's going to help Nepalese and Afghanistani cricketers make a living off this sport. Like imagine him being told that like it, it's such a mind bending concept because that wouldn't have even been something that he would have even thought about. And I think it's a shame. He kind of, he missed that first glory era. Well, sorry, mm -hmm. I should say he passes away during that first glory era. Um, you know, when Australia has two great leg spinners. Um, and then, uh, it, I've got this theory. Let's, I'll see how you feel about this. I think let everyone in cricket knows, what the phrase leg cutter and googly is, right? Mm -hmm. Those are normal phrases. But both of those balls completely faded away, right? Mm -hmm. To the point at which we probably had a few bowlers who could bowl them at, at, a, at a certain point playing in international cricket. And so it's great for me to see bowlers now bowling leg cutters as slower balls mm -hmm. and that coming back into the game. And then on top of that, seeing the wrong and dominate again as much as it has been. Um, so... Yeah, I think early 1900s, it has a huge impact, but it does die down, certainly post-World War II. And then T20 cricket has just brought it up. I mean, there isn't a bowler since Yazir Shah that's really been a test match bowler with a wrong and that is a constant threat. I, I mean, Kuldeep Yadav would be the other one, um, but hasn't maybe even, even Yasser's wrong and wasn't his stock delivery. It was more so the straighter one, right? No, but he could. I think he still had a weaponized one, if that makes sense, compared to someone like Warren or, or Anil Kumble. I think it was probably slightly more of a weapon. But you're right. I think his straight one probably was his better ball. But it really, it's interesting to me how much it is. It's found new ways to survive over the years, um, and and it has morphed into different kinds of things and. You know, the flipper, essentially, the only two bowlers who ever mastered the flipper were Clary Grimmett and Shane Warne, right? Hmm. At an international level. Whereas I could run into you. Well, I don't know how my shoulder is going at the moment. In fact, I might never be able to bowl one again with my shoulder. But um, <laughs> I could run into you right now and I could bowl a wrong one, right? It's mm -hmm. that simple at a certain point. But it's also within that um, simplicity is, you know, it started off with the big old leg spinner's grip. And now you've got Rashid Khan holding the ball in this really interesting way. Mm -hmm. So the ball slips out the side of his hand. You've got the Abdul Qadir finger wrongen, which mm -hmm. he had to make sure that the ball wouldn't touch his fingers so it wouldn't slow down as much. Bowlers are now looking at, you're now at a point where Ravi Bishnoi, Rehan Ahmed are probably wrongen bowlers, right? Mm -hmm. That's their stock ball. Now, that's always been, they've always had those in club cricket. We haven't had those at the international level. Like, it just keeps evolving and changing in a way. Um, and it's a fascinating ball. In fact, I'll take take it one step further. The back of the hand slow ball is essentially a wrong one, right? Mm. So it's had such a profound impact, even at the times when it wasn't being as used as much in cricket. I, I just think the whole thing is it, it, it's really fascinating. And that original story, um, I, you know, I think leg spin as a as a story is probably one of the more interesting things that have ever happened to cricket uh, from the big from the first time anyone did it. And if you think about leg spin especially compared to finger spin. Finger spin's such a weird, different kind of art because you have to hold the ball between your fingers. Leg spin is essentially just opening a doorknob, right? Mm. And yet from that, we get a wrong one and we get a flipper and we get a slider and we get Shane Warne and we get Clary Grimmett and we get Bosi and we get the four leg spinners of the apocalypse and we get Sandeep Lamachani and we get Rush. It's, it's, what is draped off that story, I think, is absolutely incredible. Um, and the fact that some kid in some part of the world where they don't even play cricket can literally go onto YouTube 
and find this incredible skill. And if he perfects it well enough, he could still go on to play in the IPL. I mean, what a bizarre part of cricket that is. Yeah, invented by the son of the sheriff of Middlesex and now a coffee lover like Adam Zampa from the Love Cafe uh, uses it to win Australia World Cup. So it is a fantastic story. And uh, yeah, there's hopefully a lot to learn for our listeners and viewers in this one. Uh, Benoit, oh, not Benoit, sorry, Bernard Bozenke is definitely a name that's going to stick we, with. We're going to say people. Benoit from the um, Netflix movies. What are they? The the uh, the, the guy that um the guy that solves crimes on on and all those Ryan um, what's his name films? Is that Benoit? Um, whatever. There must be a Benoit yeah. that's played for cricket anyway. You're you're right. That guy's name was something similar. That that, that <laughs> knives out guy, right? Yeah, Daniel that's the guy Craig. I'm thinking of. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think um, I yeah, think that's what he would have loved. Mind. Like, if they're ever going to have a cricket reference, it has to be a Bosi reference, right? Like, it's such yeah. a, it's such a beautiful one. Um, and uh, you know that, as I said, incredibly important to cricket, and yet not maybe the most famous uh, Bernard Bosin K that has ever been. Maybe not even the most famous person in his family. What a bizarre life to have lived. Go, go, Google Bernard Bosin K, and you'll see the philosopher come up first. So that's basically. Jared's point proven. But uh, anyway, hope there was a lot of learning in this one. And uh, I, I want to see this name appear more on social media. So all of you guys who are listening in and tuning in, make sure that uh, Bozen K goes viral. But that'll be it for this episode of the Footmarks podcast. Jared and I will be here with you next week once again, nerding, about, nerding out about something stupid. That's all for this one. Goodbye.